Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, and it's a beautiful day in South Florida. I'm hoping that this is working. Wouldn't you know the technology gurus are not lining up in my favor, and uh, my computer camera didn't log on, so I'm doing this from my phone. A little bit different than what I expected, but I want to wish all the women in the Pay It Fort series a blessed morning if you're in Florida or uh, in America. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. If you're in England, it's probably lunchtime. If you're in Australia, you may be getting ready to go to sleep. But I'm so excited to be here. My name is Debbie Montgomery Johnson, and I'm one of the contributing authors to the Pay It Forward series, Notes to My Younger Self, Volume 1. And I'm so excited to have been part of this series uh, brought to you all by Kazia Luckett, my dear friend who was at the time living in England and now is in Barcelona. Uh, we've been asked to encourage you all to read the stories. There are 18 fabulous stories in each of the books. We've got volume one, volume two, and volume three is on its way. And we're here to inspire you in some, in some way to own your own story and to share it with others so that you might be able to help another uh, who may be going through something similar to what you've gone through. And what those defining moments are are all different for each one of us, but we encourage you to dig deep inside and find out what really makes you tick and what makes you want to share your life with others in a special way. And we're also taking, um, we're, our aim is to touch, excuse me, our aim is to touch a billion lives in as quickly as possibly, as quickly as possible, and to give others hope that uh, there is joy in this life and whatever our demons might have been, whatever might be our limiting beliefs, we can rise above those things. And by writing a story to yourself, uh, I wrote to myself at, when I was age 15, um, I was able to look back at the things that happened to me back then and assess them and, and see how they might affect my life today. And I'm going to take the time today to read my story. Um, it's in the book, but before that, this is it's kind of backwards, notes to my younger self. It's available on Amazon, and we'll put the links up on the Facebook page. Um, but we want to encourage you to read it, write your own story, pass it on to someone else, so that this can go around the globe. And the profits from this book are going to the Global Fund for Women, enabling them to find their rightful place in the world. And the book is available on Amazon. It's called the Pay It Forward series, Notes to My Younger Self. Uh, in the book, you'll find that there'll be a page in the beginning where you can actually write your own story. With guide in the back, Kazia has given us a, a great guide in the back on how to write your story and, and what to put out there for others. So I'm so excited to be doing this. I'm a little bit frazzled because I just got a phone call. I have a delivery coming in five minutes, and I'm like, not today. So I've got my son in the background doing it, and I hope that the phone won't ring and that all will be well for the next few minutes. So thank you so much for being with me. Again, I'm Debbie Montgomery, and my story is called Refined by Fire. What am I passionate about? I'm passionate about women finding their own, finding their own story within themselves. And to own up to that, take responsibility for that, be 100% responsible for the good, the bad, the ugly, the necessary, and then help someone else beside you. So, question was, describe that pivotal moment in my life that I chose to speak about here. Well, there have been so many times in my life, and what could be classified as that pivotal moment? Um, I had to choose the one for this story. And my most public moments um, to date, and many of you know this, many of you don't, is that I, uh, I was scammed for over a million dollars on an online dating romance uh, relationship. And I actually wrote a book about that. It was called The Woman Behind the Smile, Triumph Over the Ultimate Online Dating Betrayal. Um, that's not what I'm gonna be talking about today. But what I did wanna find out when I was challenged to write about my story is what in my life might have led me to be so vulnerable uh, to that online dating betrayal. So I'm gonna take you back to Woodstock, Vermont where I grew up, and this is back in January of 1974. I was just 15 years old, and I was packing to go away to school uh, for the first time to boarding school. I was so excited to go away to Exeter Academy. It was one of the most prestigious schools in the United States, and although I was scared to leave home, 
for the first time without my family, I was thrilled at the thought of new friends, of great sports teams, and an academic challenge that was beyond belief. And I'm not sure if that was my idea or my parents. But Exeter had a beautiful campus with brick dormitories and classrooms, a magnificent library, and a state-of-the-art physical education facility, and acres and acres of playing fields. It was a college prep campus, and those attending were college-bound. The competition was fierce, and I was honored to be accepted to this school in my mid-sophomore year. Again, I was 15. But two weeks before I was to leave to for Exeter, my idyllic life was shattered by what I call the fire. I'm going to have my dad describe the fire. He's actually the author of a book called 50 Golden Years. But although the fire in Pineview 2, my home, was the first devastating and pivotal event of my life, I came into the story after the fact because I was at church with my younger brothers and then I was picked up by a friend's mom only to find out what had happened during the previous few hours. In the words of my father, January 18, 1974. It was a typically frigid day with temperatures reaching minus five degrees. When I arrived home for dinner from the office, it was pleasant. Since the experiences of Christmas holiday were still fresh and some decorations were still scattered throughout the house, the house was filled with the odor of, of the soon to be served dinner. Then as Gwen, my wife, gave me a greeting kiss, she calmly told me that she had had difficulty getting our relatively new station wagon started today because it was so cold. I turned and went directly to the garage that I had just parked my Jeep in, next to my garden tractor, now that, that now served as a snowblower. After a few tries, I was able to get the wagon started and I laid a brick on the accelerator pad in order to keep the engine running at the speed that would soon recharge the battery. This was an operation that I had performed a multitude of times on cold days, but I noticed a smell of gasoline, and that wasn't unusual when a car had been flooded, but it was kind of strange today. With the task completed, I returned to the house through the breezeway that connected the garage to the house, and I left the car running in the garage. Now, my parents were in the process of completely redecorating the first floor of the house. So many of my grandfather's items, pictures, trophies, paintings, books, they were all outside uh, in our dining room, laid out on top of the table. So my mom and dad had to be eating dinner downstairs. At approximately 8 p.m. downstairs, the room suddenly became pitch black, and it was evident that we had lost our electricity, but why? I moved around and looked out at the small window, the basement, small wi basement window, and observed that the entire outside area was lit up with shades of orange and red that were very ominous. Gwen and I raced upstairs to the kitchen and to the back door only to experience the shock of seeing the garage in flames, which nearly overpowered us. Because we had lost electricity and had no phone service, we were unable to quickly report the fire to the local fire station. So we ran away from the house to get to the neighbors to make the call. I stepped in front of the garage and wanted to quickly get into my Jeep, which might be saved from the burning garage. But Gwen, however, grabbed me and said, I love you and you are not going in there. Discretion taken over, I decided she was right. So we raced down the driveway and within seconds of fiery explosion, took what was left of my station wagon and engulfed my little Jeep, along with my beautiful International Harvester tractor, and it blew up in flames. Gwen was right again, and I was thankful for her good sense. What are wives for, eh? I can always buy another four-wheeler. My father, oh my gosh. At that point, our family was changed forever. Our world and our worldly things were either consumed by or damaged by fire, water, and smoke, or so it seemed to me at the time. Looking back on that, why is that important in my journey? Because the fire for me was a lesson in finding out what was truly important. Yes, I had all of my new clothes, stuffed animals, pillows, books, and sports equipment, all out ready to be packed up for my move to Exeter. 
My life was about to change and my emotions were just on the edge and my belongings now were completely ruined. Our beautiful home was now dripping with stained water and things were either charred or covered in soot and ash. And I will never forget the smell of smoke for the rest of my life. I cried for our loss. I cried as I saw my mom and dad crying because everything they had worked for and provided for my brothers and me was physically gone. However, the most important part of the fire was not the loss of the stuff, but that I came to recognize the value of family and service. No one was hurt in the fire except for my sweet powder, my beautiful long-haired Angora cat, who died of smoke inhalation the day after the fire. I saw firsthand, though, the value of service and of a community coming together to help us clean out without any thought of remuneration. I learned that our worldly possessions were just that, stuff. Nice to have, but totally unnecessary in living a truly meaningful life. When I got to Exeter, I was dropped off rather quickly in a new environment with no one around that I knew and everything new in my suitcase. Although my new roommates and teachers were friendly and kind, I felt like a little fish in a very big ocean and sharks were circling. Some were nurse sharks and some felt like big whites. I was an A student back home, excelling in academics, sports and music. At Exeter, I was one of a thousand who were just like me, but now half of us were going to be at the bottom of the class, a first for me. I struggled with math and science initially, so gone was my dream of becoming an anesthesiologist. I worked hard in English, music, and French classes and earned my way onto the squash and tennis teams. The classes were six days a week with sports events on Wednesdays and Saturday afternoons, so I rarely got home to see my parents. I missed them terribly and didn't feel I could express those feelings of fear because of, of not doing my part or being strong enough to face the adversity. I knew they were still struggling with getting the house cleaned up and repaired so that there would be a home when I came back in May. I had to man up, woman up, and get my grades up because competition, my competitive side, was dying because of my failures. I fell in love for the first time at Exeter with a terrific young man from Massachusetts. Although I say today that I really didn't like dating when I was young, our relationship was the closest thing to being home, and I clung to it with all my heart and soul. He was a year older than I and had some of the same struggles with academics that I had, but we rarely talked about those. We took long walks and when possible, we went to his parents' home for part of the weekends just to get away from the pressures we felt at school. I was very sensitive about my looks. Was I as pretty as my roommates? I didn't think so. Was I as smart as my other girlfriends? I didn't think so. But when I was with him, it didn't matter. I was important to him, and that made me feel good. However, he did say once that I looked better in a skirt than jeans. So for about 30 years after we broke up, I didn't wear jeans. Either he was a leg man, or I just didn't know how to pick out a big, good pair of jeans. We helped each other out through a challenging time in our youth, and we had many defining moments and pivotal experiences together, but that's a whole nother book's worth. My experience with the fire and going away to Exeter taught me to be strong and to jump into new experiences. I learned to adapt and to be tenacious in my striving for excellence. I was determined to be the top of the class by the end of my senior year. I had made the principal's honor list by then, but I accepted that I didn't have to be number one. And there had been a long time that I'd been, and I realized that as long as I had been kind, hardworking and of service to another, I would be the best. I sometimes put myself into situations where I felt like I wasn't enough, but I now know that just that's just a limiting belief and not reality. I know that I am enough because I'm a daughter of God and I was put on this earth for a divine reason and my experiences in life have given me what I need to succeed. But based on these experiences and the wisdom and all that I've learned since then, what would I say to myself if I were writing back to myself at age 15? 
This was a challenge in our book, so here's my letter to myself. Dear Debbie, wow, you have certainly had a lifetime of incredible experiences, the good, the bad, and the necessary. What a strong woman you have become, and what an example of goodness, grace, and resilience you are to women around the world today. If I were talking to you back at Exeter, I would never have seen you then as you are now. So I want you to listen up. I want you to remember that you are a tru truly a young woman of divine nature and worth. Not only are you precious to your mom and dad, and no, they didn't get to know your hometown girlfriend better than you just because you went away to school, but you are precious to all you come in contact with. You have a special gift of listening with your heart. You have the power and grace to comfort others in their time of need or pain in spite of your own grief and insecurities. Remember to talk about your feelings. Don't stuff them in order to appear in control. Many will call on you and will call you a strong woman, and I want you to believe them. But don't shut off your feelings in order to be strong in the sight of others. Being vulnerable isn't a sign of weakness, and in fact, it's the thing that others will be drawn to you as you grow older. Think kindly of yourself as you look in the mirror. You have beautiful long brown hair that is special to the men in your life, but it frames a beautiful and genuinely kind face. Your dark brown eyes can pierce the soul of others. But that special glint in them draws them in and showers them with your love. You feel that you are a big girl in stature, and others say that you've got big athletic bones. And that may be true, but your outside doesn't define your inside. You can and will gain and lose weight over the years, and you will find a body type that fits you one day. Work hard at seeing inner beauty, and it will reflect your outer beauty. You will be lovelier as you grow older because you will be more accepting of yourself then. Wear jeans if you want. You may hear others' remarks, but stand up and be true to you and do what you want, not what others want for you. Always surround yourself with good people, those who are honest, full of integrity, kind, helpful, and filled with spirit. Life is about relationships, not things and you learned that because of the fire. Debbie, my dear, hold true to your standards. You were taught well and you know how valuable you are. Don't do what others might be doing if you feel it might compromise your beliefs. Learn all you can through study, travel, experiences, and good people. Yet hold on to that internal compass for it will guide you for good. Take more risks as you get older. Jump off that high pole and grab the trapeze once you assess the security and the dangers. You tend to assess things and sometimes you miss out on living. Love, live, lead, and with that, jump into a life that you might be proud of. Know that throughout your life you'll feel love, you'll feel deep sadness, and then you'll feel great joy. All experiences will be for your good if you believe things happen for that reason. Find the reason and the good in all situations. And when you're in the middle of something fearful, sad, or scary, go through it quickly. Don't wallow in self-pity and shame. Like you learned early in life, man up and move forward. Your experience will help another one day. And your joy will be in seeing others jump. Debbie, use your physical and mental strength for your good and keep healthy. You'll find joy in being able to walk, run, swim, and play with your grandchildren one day. Your health is precious. Too many take it for granted, and then one day find they don't have it. Be mindful of your eating habits and take all things in moderation. Be happy in your body. Others will tell you that you're too skinny or too heavy. You'll feel like there's no winning, but you'll know what's perfect for you. Don't let the mirror of your past keep you from seeing your present and future beauty. Like the airline attendants tell us, if traveling with others, put on your own mask first before helping another. Your well 
must be filled before you can give yourself to others. You will need to learn how to gently say no to others lest you take on too many projects. Doing everything for everyone else keeps them from the blessings of doing things for themselves. Teach and live self-reliance and prepare for your every needful thing. You will find your reward in heaven if you don't find it here on earth. So today, as I write back to you as a young woman who dropped off everything in a scary, exciting, wonderful experience, I say to you, embrace the challenge. Share your feelings as you grow so that you can lift up another going through similar experiences. Stand up in your power and grace and be the voice of an articulate, smart, kind, and compassionate woman. The world is looking to you as a leader. Lead with love and elevate another as you go forward. Hugs to you, my dearest. What golden, experience, what golden nuggets did I learn from this whole experience? I learned that life as I see it has peaks and valleys. The peaks are exciting and provide some of the most fun, happy memories. Yet the valleys provide some of the most impactful possibilities of pain and opportunities for learning and growth. Control and perfectionism tell us to stay in the box where we feel comfortable. They tell us to manipulate our environments so we never feel vulnerable, needy, or uncertain. They keep us safe from our fear of failing, embarrassment, or rejection, and sadly, we miss out on a lot of life because of them. As I write this piece, my control buttons are just screaming, and the grip of procrastination was crashing down on me. Perhaps I feel vulnerable opening it up to another pivotal moment in my life because my defining moments are now out in the public for all to hear see and comment on. My most vulnerable times are being sliced and diced so others can learn from what I went through. And that's very important, yet somewhat uncomfortable for me. What would I tell other women experiencing things in their lives? Learn from your experiences and stand up for yourself no matter what. Be mindful of what others want from you and be kind, but don't give away the farm just because others want something from you. Family is so important, and for me, friends fall into that category. But not everyone is your friend, and I had to learn that the hard way. I was taken advantage by several people in my life, but going back to learning that stuff isn't everything in life. I live by the saying, our last suit has no pockets, and I'm not going to take anything physical with me, but I will take my experiences, my loves, and my knowledge with me, and those that are those are the most important things. So do your due diligence in business transactions and be mindful of your resources. Always take care of yourself before giving to others because you don't want to forget your own oxygen mask. Now, I don't really believe that I can go back and change anything that had happened in my past. I really don't want to because those things happened and I, there was learning in every lesson. I would have wanted to spare my family the hurt of losing our home and all the precious treasures, but we can't take those things with us. I've learned by going away to school that I didn't want my children to go away from me during their formative years. Again, for me, family is forever and so important for me. But I believe my experiences have molded me into the woman I am today and one that finally recognizes her worth and potential to do good. Do I have any final words for you? Absolutely. I say believe in yourself. Treasure the people in your life and learn from your experiences so that you don't learn from their experiences so that you don't have to learn everything for yourself. I say speak up so that others can learn from you and CTR, choose the right. I have learned to love again and I have learned that life is good, truly good, because of my good, bad, and necessary experiences. So today I want you to look at your life, look at those things that you want to, to pay forward, that you want to share with others. Take a good look at our book, the Pay It Forward series, Notes to My Younger Self. Volume one, volume two are on Amazon. Volume three is in the workings. I encourage you to find the joy in your life 
through the hardships that you've had. Experience the love, the laughter, the hurt, the sadness, the joy, whatever there is in your life. Find a friend, share the stories with her, pass it on to someone you don't know, hold the hands of those sitting beside you so that your story can lift them, elevate them to another level. You can be the one for them. You can be the one for yourself, but choose today to stand up, speak up, and woman up. My name is Debbie Montgomery Johnson, and I'm so excited to be part of this Pay It Forward series. Thank you, Kazia Luckett and my 18 volume one book sisters, my 18 volume two book sisters, and all those that are going to be book sisters in the future. Shine your light, go out in the world, and be the one today. Have a great day, everybody. Love you all. Bye now.